start recording us. Hello. Hello, everyone. Right. Hello. Uh, right. I am Robert. Uh, I'm your host here today, and I'm also joined by Angela, who's also hosting us as well uh, as uh, her first time uh, in, in that capacity. So thank you very much for coming along. For those, because uh, there are some new faces here, including my son, who's wearing a chef's hat for some reason. I have no idea why. <laughs> and I'm Angela's <laughs> mother. <laughs> there you go, are you, just? <laughs> Um, so I am Robert, uh, and I'm coming in from New Zealand, Aotearoa, uh, so that's where I am. And so um, just a quick, what I'll do is I'll just ask you to sort of go around and quickly introduce yourselves for everyone so that we get to know who you are, where you're coming in from. Um, and I normally start with someone in the room, but today I'll start with myself, and we'll finish up with Angela last. Uh, and uh, we'll just go go from there. So if you um, just introduce yourself and then pick someone else to introduce uh, to themselves afterwards. Uh, I, so I am Robert. Um, I'm a software engineer, uh, distributed software engineer with a background in finance. I've been doing things in the blockchain for quite a while. Uh, and um, I have a terrible habit of uh, not shutting up. So <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not what I can. Um, and uh, basically, I'm just sort of really interested in uh, new forms of um, organizing with the internet and uh, new economic models and all that sort of stuff. So, and a particular interest in social and environmental finance is what a uh, big interest I have. Okay. Uh, Bob, I'll get you to introduce yourself. Okay, um, good evening, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm based in Melbourne. It's great to be here. Um, it's my third uh, town hall. Um, I, uh, I'm actually the consulting space. Um, I've had I've been privileged to sort of live and work in different countries, including Africa, um, for about six and a half years in southern and western Africa. So I'm um, very keen to work on a proposal, um, which I've discussed with Robert and Angela briefly once the last town hall, I think. Um, yeah, which I'm looking to sort of uh, understand the process and build up the idea, get some uh, people to support uh, me as part of a team to see if we can um, make a successful proposal. And yeah, it's great to be here. Happy to provide any feedback. I've got a lot of experience in sales marketing and um, let's say uh, leadership in different international businesses. The last one I worked with was Toyota Susho Corporation. So uh, that's it in, in a nutshell. And um, Maybe, uh, Angela, you can um, give everybody a brief update of yourself. Hi, I just did, but again. Okay. Hi. All right, well, yeah. No, no worries, um, no worries, no worries. Good choice, Boban. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so my name is Angela uh, Gatender. I'm uh, from East Africa. I'm currently in Nairobi. I have, my background is in architecture. And then I sort of ended up <laughs> a software engineer. I'm a Plutus pioneer, and I am very, very interested and have quite a bit of experience working with Eastern African women. And so my purpose, even more than just bringing all the Eastern African countries, is to help the Eastern African women. Um, and so I started that by bringing my mom. Who will talk after? Carolyn, please. Hey everyone, I'm Carolyn. I'm currently in Germany, but I'm part or a co-founder of a startup that's based in Uganda, which is called Wire Collective. And we got funded in Fund 6, actually. And our goal is to elevate manufacturing in Africa. So what we're doing is... Um, building a production network on Cardano to produce fashion um, for the locals. So made in Uganda for, for the Ugandan people. And yeah, that's what we are doing at the moment. So Anne. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, wow, I'm feeling quite intimidated by this meeting. 
It's my first time. Uh, so I'm Anne Gatende, I'm Angela's mom. Um, I'm guilty for steering her towards computer programming. Um, I am very passionate about um, develop, de um, building an, what we call empowering, building, uh, we, we, we talk about building a net or, good Lord, <laughs> empowering people in digital, uh, Digital empowerment, basically, that's what we're talking about, because I'm very concerned about the digital divide in Africa, and I feel very worried. Um, so my background is education. Um, I, am, I have taught at Nairobi University in communication, and in uh, the past four years, I am a Microsoft Global Trainer. So I represent a company called Virtual Learning Solutions, and we, we train and certify um, people in um, with Microsoft um, certifications, and um, I have worked mostly in development. So we get funded mostly by NGOs to support, particularly the girl child, um, marginalized um, and disempowered girls and young women. And um, I'm a mother of three daughters, so I'm very passionate about girls and young women. And I'm very proud of Angela for how she has stood her ground in this field. And um, yeah, so I'm just excited to be here. I am um, interested in doing a proposal around that, around empowerment of our people uh, in this new world, the new world of blockchain and uh, starting from bottom up. So as many people are talking about them, do they even know what is going on? In the Ministry of ICT, we have a task force that explores blockchain. There is a, in the Ministry of uh, Lands, there is a blockchain with IBM to, to um, understand that or to put together um, a land title deeds. So there's a few ideas floating around, but at the level of just the normal citizen, there's hardly any understanding of this. Uh, there's a lot of buzz about Bitcoin and stuff like that, cryptocurrency. So my interest is just diving in and seeing how my target people who are girls and young women in rural areas, um, urban areas, urban youth, um, um, at, at risk, vulnerable youth who, who we work with, and also teachers who handhold the children who are in school. So the whole education ecosystem and how to bring that on board. So I'm having a few thoughts and I'm throwing around a few ideas in my head around what we can do, but it would be mostly around really just knowledge building um, on what this is all about. Yeah, and particularly uh, with an example of Cardano. So. It's still very green to me. I'm not very, very confident about it, but I'm looking forward to learning more. Thank you so much. Nice to meet you all. My kids are in Melbourne. So I hear. <laughs> it's lovely well, to meet nice you. Yeah. <laughs> Tivo. Nice to see a Melbourneian here. Yeah. <laughs> Hello. Um, so I'm from a technical background in loving to script and code and did some game development and found out the, the blockchain and got just like, oh my God, this changed this entire world and just saw the vision, but uh, and felt again that it is now possible for individuals to take control of their data. Um, so it, it started very slow and just by investing and learning, you know, like looking up YouTube stuff, and then at some point this project catalyst started and this is where like everything changed for me i didn't know i like coordination and project management and like or, like all of that stuff in an, in a cooperative way that i don't know a person i just jumped to in with him in the zoom call and we just start making documentation sharing information sharing insights and building from the experience what what comes from these uh, zoom calls and these meetings and from this, the swarm was evolved, the Eastern downhole, all the ideas, the, they, they sprung up from very few people. And now this is so big that you, well, like 
thanks for Robert and Felix and who like take this one pers idea and like build on this while I go other do other stuff and it, I I mean like it so basically this is what I do I I go around I I help to document help to visualize the pathways uh, and the like, the projects and and support them with information I have <laughs> as much. Uh, Tivo is also known as Miro. <laughs> he likes to use the Miro board a lot. Um, yeah, Joe, uh, would you like to introduce yourself? Kia ora. Sorry, Kata. just coming back from a, from a thing. Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. I'll just turn my camera on. Hey, hi, Kia ora. from New Zealand. How are you? Um, I'm Jo. I um, live about 10 minutes away from Rob and um, I have been, what have I been doing? Well, I, I run a, um, I'm a co-founder of an entrepreneurship centre here in, in New Zealand. We've been going for about eight years now and um, doing lots of events. We have events going on every week. Um, and then we have some big ones that happen um, at different points during the year, including startup weekends, which you may have heard about, um, which is a whole bunch of community members coming together for a weekend and kind of doing a bit of an entrepreneur boot camp. Um, very similar, but over, but over a condensed period to the, um, the pitch for Eastern Town Hall which is, I think it's over a month um, to do a similar kind of event. Um, and I got involved with Cardano specifically at the beginning of this year, um, but have been talking and working with Rob on um, how we can kind of democratize, I suppose, the entrepreneur process um, because it's very driven by kind of investor um, viewpoint here in New Zealand, at least, but but also in you know other places in the world. Um, and we have it's community led, and it's and it's a wide community. So we have everything from eight year olds starting to code uh, through kids at school um, doing entrepreneurship as part of their. Um, part of their, their um, year, essentially, their, their curriculum. So if you're in business studies in a secondary school in New Zealand, you have the opportunity to start a business um, through one year um, of your course. And so we run that program, which is called the Young um, Enterprise Scheme here in New Zealand. Uh, so we just had our finals um, a week or so ago, and there were about nine teams in total of, of between three and six kids. Um, and they, they, you know, they go through the whole kind of boot camp thing and then uh, they do their pitch, their final pitches, which is what happened um, last week. Um, and uh, yeah, looking forward to working on the proposal that we got funded yeah <laughs> which I'm still really excited about <laughs> which is kind of creating a um a canvas because that's what we that's what we use um at our startup weekends and in most of our events that we run um through our center um just so that that you start creating a bit of a shared language and people start understanding how the different bo blocks of business work together and um, obviously that's all changing with Cardano with uh, distributed ledger, ledger technology and all the other pieces that go together with it um, so we need a new new canvas to kind of describe what a business on Cardano looks like so um, looking forward to digging into that and getting all of your ideas and um, even Jack's ideas because he's got a big light bulb over his head. <laughs> no, I think Correction, that's, not... that's a chef hat. Chef hat. 
<laughs> oh, you're going to make the Portuguese tarts, Jack. Yay. <laughs> We're going off track here. Come on. Well, introduce no. oh, yourself. Yeah, introduce um, yourself now, Jack. Then. <laughs> introduce yourself. <laughs> Yeah, over to you, Jack. Uh, just remove my hat out of respect. Just uh, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> Gone. Um, I'm a. Uh, I started yeah. out as a musician, right? So I really was sort of in the music world, making records in my room, uh, and took did, didn't really have any idea where I was wanting to go, um, and I thought. You know, when you start off young, you're like, oh, I don't know where, I have no idea where the direction of my future is going to be in the 10 years of those people that say, where do you want to be in the next 10 years? And they, if you don't, if you leave it up to them, they normally fill it out for you. Um, and, you know, I got a degree in music and I was like, that's cool. And then what? I got nowhere. So I more or less had to reevaluate my situation. And lo and behold, I got pulled into this space called blockchain called uh, decentralized finance, this weird thing. My cousin, I think, uh, if I recall, called it funny money. That's the funny money, isn't it? And I'm like, uh, yes, yes, the funny money. I work in, in the funny money business. <laughs> uh, so that, so this whole area of finance and technology, financial cryptography is super, super cool. And now that's, I guess it's something that uh, Angela, you and I have something in common is that both our parents have forced us to code now. So as a result, I'm more or less learning Haskell and basically have been, uh, have gone through the Plutus Pioneers program and really starting out as a functional programmer, um, you know, as a means to an end. <laughs> so I'm kind of more or less now moving and as a result i'm sort of doing all the content creation for the eastern town hall i've jumped across different DAOs, doing different things i did uh, a video just recently for the catalyst circle so i'm experimenting with new workflows and pipelines and now i'm slowly going into all the continuous integration and continuous development for project frameworks and that's project management and that's going to be very very important especially for you know setting up on these proposals because we really have no idea where to start so it's just a matter of aggregating all this information and moving into the end this is the great thing is is that i could just jump to different things and, and it's not necessarily specializing in them it's more or less just dipping your feet in different ponds and so i don't know what's going to happen next uh right now it's devops and learning everything about Git, github uh and actions and maybe the next thing it could be developing i don't know economic models or token in, tokenomics for the proposals that we got funded for um, which was, and also maybe helping out with the Eastern Town Hall stuff because of all the, especially with all the content creation and maybe setting up all the uh, issues and frameworks and stuff and the projects stuff, things for that. So that's where I'm at. That's what I'm in. I'm a, I'm a musician. I make music and somehow I've ended up in the world of fin finance and technology programming machines. I, I don't know how this happened. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a strange world. Uh, as you can see, he's a creative. <laughs> Uh, yeah, the, yeah, thanks. Eh? The uh, Peter, how, uh, good to see you here, Peter. How about you int quickly introduce yourself? <laughs> uh, there we go. No, we, we still haven't got it, Multiple Peter. Come. Buttons. <laughs> You're supposed to be the podcast to come on. <laughs> I know. And each time I come in here, I have the same issues every, every time. So it's... um. I still haven't let Robert. It's okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm from uh, Gold Coast, Australia, and I, I actually don't know how to class myself these days. Uh, so I, I do a whole bunch of different things in the Kadana ecosystem, and I don't know what to title myself anymore. Um, so I thought maybe both, I just did, you and me both. Yeah, I, I just don't know. So I just give you a rundown <laughs> what I did this week. Um, I interviewed an NFT project called Duo, which is a card-based game, which is absolutely amazing. It's uh, they're trying to gamify and and uh, bring in adoption for Cardano, and it's a, it's a pretty interesting project. Um, stepping through a learning management system for Cardax, doing um, a Catalyst actually, um, a Catalyst course for uh, Cardax, the um, Dex. Um, building out our anti-scam website, uh, so the uh, we that's our catalyst proposal that we won. 
uh, got um, funding for it and we're just building out the website for it now. So we've built the API and the backend and everything that. So if anyone wants to tap into that data that we've collected and all these scams that we have detected, uh, you can get all that data and you can pass it over to your decentralized app. So whatever you're um, building out there, you can get that data now. Um, the API is actually up. Um, there's just no front facing um, website. Uh, so that's our next stage that we're doing. Uh, we built an integration for NAMI wallet to WordPress. So now you can log into WordPress websites using NAMI. Um, so just install the plugin, plug in some of your API credentials from Blockfrost um, and payment addresses if you need to, and you've pretty much got a WordPress website ready to go integrated with NAMI. Um, and then I'm doing research blog posts for various wallets, alternatives to uh, Daedalus and Uroi. That's me. So I excuse you for uh, putting your mic on mute, you know, because I can totally relate to the, the fragmented mindset that you're working on so many different things you don't know where you're at. <laughs> yeah. Regina, would no you idea like what I'm to... doing these days? <laughs> yeah. Regina, would you like to introduce yourself? You don't have to, but uh, please, please feel free to if you want to. Yeah, um, hello. Um, my name is Regina. Yeah, um, based in Tanzania. Um, currently, I'm a director at um, a company called Rich Feelings, uh, Rich Feelings uh, Forex in Tanzania. We're doing, we, we, we're basically providing education in trading, uh, we were doing uh, Forex trading, but can, nowadays we have shifted. We're introducing more people to the blockchain technology and how to trade um, uh, the cryptos. And also we do analysis to them um, and provide them um, uh, um, explaining different opportunities that are on blockchain technology. Uh, this is my first meeting. So my friend introduced me to, to the e East Africa Decentralized, I think, Summit. So, alliances. So, and I saw this link and I've just joined. So, I'm just, um, I'm just brainstorming um, and looking what are you guys doing and if there's anything that I can add or I can, I can gain some knowledge from you guys, I appreciate it. Thank you. Well, welcome and thanks for being here. I really, really appreciate appreciate it. Um, so as you can see here, we've got a lovely mix of people, uh, all sorts of different backgrounds, uh, those sort of things. And so the way I tend to try and run the sort of room is basically um, as a sort of I ask a few questions and then we go from, from there or people, if you've got any particular things that you, you, you want to test out, ideas you want tested out, or uh, if you're thinking about fun seven or thoughts or anything that really, uh, we just let it flow and go from there. This is how I sort of roll basically with this room. Um, and it's nice just to see you all here. Uh, it just really is. It's actually really, really lovely to see everyone coming in from different places. What I will just uh, cover uh, is that obviously Fund 7 is coming up. It opens up in uh, November the 11th. Uh, from what you can tell here is a few of us have already got funded. So Joe's been funded. Uh, Peter's been funded. Uh, Jack and I have been funded. Carolyn's been funded. Uh, Angela, have you been funded as well for a project out of Fund 6? Oh, no. Um, so, and TiVo, you've been funded for stuff as well, haven't you? Um, and so there's a whole bunch of us that have been successful in Fund 6. Uh, TiVo has been successful, I think, in Fund uh, 5 as well, probably, no doubt, and there's some things. Um, so there's quite a bit of knowledge in terms of how to work within the catalyst process itself and how to pull together successful proposals and that sort of thing. So Fund 7 starts on November the 11th and the first stage goes into the insight sharing stuff. And one of the things, and hopefully um, from just all the introductions that you've heard now, is that Catalyst is a non-competitive environment, right? We're not competing against each other or anything. In fact, we're actually trying to collaborate. That's the key thing here. We're trying to collaborate, trying to help each other out. 
Okay. Um, and so part of that is to try and actually establish the relationships and that we're going to be more effective in Catalyst and our success within the Kadado platform and largely the vision that it represents if we can actually create a high trust environment of people working together in a sort of collaborative way. We're going to be able to work far, far better together. And so the insight sharing phase within the first week is about achieving, starting to sort of uh, catalyze that, um, where people can put up their ideas, the sort of things that they're interested in. Um, you're restricted to a title and a small amount of characters to try and distill your idea together. And it's there, people can comment on them and go through. It is not a proposal. It's just really about putting you into a context and getting others to go into the, con in the shared context uh, and building relationships uh, through that. And of course, things like Eastern Town Hall also helps us build those sort of relationships. Um, and uh, we go further along. So obviously, Bobbin has been interested in like looking at uh, fast moving consumer goods sort of sector within uh, Africa. Um, so he would be certainly interested in sort of uh, looking at, for example, what Carolyn's doing in terms of doing manufacturing side of things and how that might fit into that sort of environment. Vice versa, all of those that are in Tanzania and and uh, and uh, in on the ground in Africa, obviously, have a better understanding of what's actually occurring there and and what challenges and stuff we face than someone that's sitting uh, the other side of the globe. Um, even if you do have all your daughters in Melbourne, <laughs> except for one, Angela's obviously. <laughs> um, so uh, anyway, um, perhaps. Um, what I would like to do, I'll just check out uh, if we've got anything going on. Are there any sort of general questions or anything else um, that you wanted to sort of discuss tonight? Is there anything that people are interested in uh, going through or covering? Um, anything like that at all? Any... Yeah, I've got um, just uh, thanks, Robert, for that sh um, sort of short intro in terms of Fund 7. Um, as far as the insight sharing part, um, what what forum is that in and what's the process there, just sort of in a, in a nutshell? Uh, it's just the first phase within idea scale. So you go into idea scale, it's open for okay. a week. Yeah. And essentially what happens is all the insights then actually get archived after a week. It's really about trying to put everyone into uh, uh, a shared context. Okay, because yeah. there's the shared context getting ready for Fun7 uh, and bringing uh, your ideas and stuff to the table, all sort of things you're noticing and uh, going on. Um, so it's really just like you could put up one insight, you could put up um, you know, half a dozen if you wanted to, or you could comment on a okay. whole lot. Right. It's really just about interacting and seeing what takes your fancy or sharing a bit of knowledge around. And as I say, it's actually about putting you in that context um, it's yeah. one way. One way to think of it is like um, uh, you, if you were a surgeon and you were scrub going into a surgery, you scrub your, you know, you go through this ritual of scrubbing in and putting on your scrubs and mm. all that sort of thing, yeah, yeah. Uh, ready for the surgery. In a sense, that's what the, the insight phase is doing uh, and getting yeah. you to think yeah. about. Do yeah, no, mean, yeah. The two Sorry, main things on. what uh, are asked in insight sharing phase is either look at the challenge and add, uh, like improve it, improve the challenge itself, or um, like what kind of KPIs there could be to measure to, to help this challenge, or what kind of areas people should look into to, uh, to, to get more grasp about this challenge, and what could be written on the challenge itself, the proposal seat. And another part of that is you give insight uh, of related to information to that challenge. So like when Robert said, it was about uh, doctors doing an operational. So the insight should be where to, right now there is an institute who sells these rubber clothes in a very cheap way and like a good access and for example. So yeah, so this is like two part the insight. Yeah. And is it is it sort of more assessed as a, at a conceptual level, or do you need to provide some? Um, I know it's uh, you know statistics or any of those sort of deep. All of these there. will work. Yeah. Some okay. people 
people put actually analogs or what funny jokes related, but yeah. uh, mm -hmm. some give statistical data to hey check this out because this is this will help everybody who sees that. And some have like a user journey or already give a hint of problem they want to they are going to propose. So yeah. Okay. No problem. Um, but back to your earlier point, Robert, um, certainly it's great to be here and you're right, there's a lot of diverse experience. I'm happy to engage with, um, uh, you know, anybody in this forum um, in relation to what they're doing or my project. I'm not sure if there's a, uh, an offline uh, mechanism for doing that, but of course, you know, we can do it through this uh, forum as well, no problem. Uh, there's always uh, offline in terms of all the sort of different uh, yeah. emails, Discord, Telegram, you name it, there's a whole lot yeah. going on. Yeah, yeah. Hey, well, Ben, uh, yeah. most of us in the Eastern African Decentralized Alliance, you can just click the link in the chat that Carolyn shared and join okay. us on WhatsApp. Yeah, all right, great, no problem. But certainly um, your experience there, and uh, Carolyn, I think the, the manufacturing space is within the scope of... Um, the project that I'm doing as well, because it is about um, uh, enabling manufacturers to um, and brand owners to move their move their products and brands across different um, uh, borders within Africa and internationally. It's to enable African brands to to grow, um, connecting manufacturers and distributors and, and brands to facilitate that. So that could be right up um, your alley there, but. Certainly, um, uh, Angela, in terms of East Africa experience, it'd be great to connect to that group for sure. So one of the things too, in terms of building <clears throat> upon the insight sharing stuff, uh, TiVo's been doing quite a bit of co-creative um, proposal workshops and he's also been doing sort of like the mini proposal workshops which is what under three thousand dollars is that correct three thousand us yeah proposals for those sort of things and it's to help people um, get the ground and start to understand what's going on and how to approach uh, the proposal writing One of the, i would uh, add there that the the $3,000 so-called uh, requirement is just arbitrary because uh, when going through this process, you can do it for like uh, for a bigger project too, if you have like 100,000 budgets and know what the, the purpose of like uh, putting this, uh, like this lower amount is to make you think in a scoped way that you, you think in a minimal requirement. So you don't, okay, have this huge problem save the world and now i have this solution which is great an institution but this doesn't help really to understand for the user who's reading the uh, what what is going on so putting like the like the requirements like low budget i don't know for everybody else it's different to to scope down what what is actually the problem you're solving to to change the world and what is the exact institution uh, part of thing you are you're going to explain in these proposals yeah one of the um i've been thinking about this a lot because i got asked to dig into the cohort reporting uh sort of work that's going on um with the funded cohorts and I, when i sort of started looking at this i sort of said well why are we doing the reporting in the first place you know what are we reporting over and it then sort of also led to this question is what exactly is Catalyst? You know, what does it represent? Why are we trying to do these things? And the thing that came through out of that was really just sort of saying, well, actually it's what Dora has framed it as for quite a while. And it's like, welcome to the experiment is that you're actually, we're actually trying to figure out where does this technology, all the different facets of it, where can this technology be used? How can it be used? And in what context? Yeah, we don't know. We don't know what is right or wrong or good or bad. Uh, we don't know how uh, just the right combination, combination of things is going to find a bit of traction on the ground in which market, we just don't know. Um, and so the whole idea uh, aside from all the community governance sort of aspects of Catalyst is really to try and do 
uh, innovation, discovery, trying to figure out what looks right. So everything, every proposal in many respects is uh, a, a request to do an experiment to try and figure some of that sort of stuff out, right? Not because uh, a lot of the stuff seems there, there seems to be quite a lot of things like we're going to create a business or we're going to um, do a DeFi protocol or something else like that. But in reality, what we're actually trying to do is figure out what the utility of this technology is good for. What is it good for? Right? And we're trying to do that collectively. Uh, and that's actually an innovation problem. Right? Uh, that's trying to figure out what it is. And traditionally, companies haven't done innovation, particularly large companies haven't done that very well. Okay. Uh, instead, we've had things called startups. But now we've got this ability through a community run treasury to actually do um, sort of uh, um, essentially a swarm sort of intelligence, if you like, because we can all come together from lots of different. Uh, uh, places and pull things together. And so the framing is that we're doing things as experiments. And the most important result, like this is from a reporting point of view, is that we've actually got to be uh, willing to accept that proposals, for example, will fail. Uh, we shouldn't be going off and trying to do massive big proposals um, in terms of what's going on, but actually trying to find a sort of a, a nice place where we say, it's okay, let's try and do this experiment in this direction. And what's important is we report back whether we, it worked or it didn't so that we can collectively learn. Now, I think that's a, it's a really important thing to sort of try and get your head around in terms of what's going on. So Anne, for example, you were talking about, you're involved in innovation and stuff like that, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, so, but mostly for me, it's capacity building of people. So I'm all about the people, that's my thing. So it's about building capacity, unlocking them and seeing them become, you know, just tap into their potential and see what they can do. So if we can start bottom up, which has become a bit of a cliche in Kenya right now uh, with the politics, but um, bottom up processes is what I'm into and really thinking about this person at the bottom, because in Africa we have what is called the forgotten bottom. <laughs> so um, we talk about these people and they don't have devices or they do, they have feature phones. Um, this, but you know, we have the land of the, 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 the money, the M-Pesa. Um, so the banking and what's going on there at, at the bottom, the unbanked have become banked quite a bit. So what exactly is going on with these people that they're saying and how much knowledge can we build in them for what the new technologies are so that they can innovate around their problems and solve some problems of their own and start to see that. So that's my interest really. I don't know whether that makes any sense. Uh, that makes a lot of sense to me because that's sort of my interest as well and Joe's interest as well, doing things from the bottom. To me, innovation is actually a human knowledge sharing problem. Um, it's, uh, you know, changing, uh, it's basically sociology and behavior change, right? Um, and so the more people we can um, bring into this train, onto this train, so to speak, the more likely we're going to lift everyone up. Uh, that, that's my sort of theory, if you like, uh, the way I sort of run on things. Um, and this is a big reason why I'm in this te technology space, uh, to do exactly that sort of thing. Um, Joe's certainly done a lot of that sort of work uh, in terms of social enterprise, trying to bring people along, uh, big focus on women and um, as well, in terms of trying to bring that, bring, um, give them the skills to solve their problems, basically, in a structured sort of way. Did you want to add anything to that, Joe? Yeah, uh, well, a question, Anne. Um, one of the one of the challenges that we've we've encountered is the resistance from the education system um, to the the idea of entrepreneurship. Um, we're we're lucky to have this scheme that we're running 
um, now it has been going for a long time, but it's been kind of a bit of a, a sideline, this young um, enterprise scheme uh, that we run, um, because the rest of the school, school system is very much, you will learn what the curriculum tells you, you will learn. <laughs> <laughs> and the uh, um, the starting from you know curiosity and um, an interest in a particular subject or you know way of operating or my boy who's fourteen you know just he's a he's a gamer that's what he's interested in school is completely boring and is completely disconnected so you know my interest in in entrepreneurship is really you know, how do you start from what's engaging the young people and then build through to something really useful in the real world from there rather than the education system? I just wondered what, what your experience is in, in Kenya of the education system and whether it's the same. Well, Kenya and Africa is young. So yeah. um, like 80% of the population is under the age of 35. Yeah. So unemployment is real. And therefore, small business enterprises, most people fall through that, uh, fall through the cracks um, of the education system because maybe they are able to take, gosh, is it 1%? <laughs> you know, so 99% out there not getting a formal right. education beyond high school. In Kenya, there is free high school education until we still call high school basic education. So there's quite right. a, quite a bit, a bit of education um, to that level, but after that, the there's a very very big fallout into small medium enterprises and business. So there's a great right. opportunity in Africa to build entrepreneurship. Um, awesome, great awesome. opportunity. So um, any program will be welcomed by government. Government is trying anything that they can do. I'm implementing a World Bank project right now. And um, we, I'm, I'm training in formal skills. So formal skills is programming in the, in the area of computer studies. And right. the, the end of the project is going more towards entrepreneurship. So the funding is going into entrepreneurship where the young people are being given an amount to start a small business. So because okay. formal employment just is not there. So the project yeah. is failing. The World Bank project that's failing and the only solution they have is to give the youth a small startup fund. So the opportunity is immense in Africa to build entrepreneurship. Yeah, that's what I would say. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Maybe we can maybe we can have another conversation offline and really really yeah. dig in. Yeah. yeah. That would be that would be awesome because I think there's a lot to yeah. for yeah. us to learn and and you know there's a lot that we can share as well yeah. from, from yeah. the experience with kids here. It's awesome. It's nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Thank you. What I'd be interested to know is um, what got people interested in the space in the first place. Carolyn, I'd be really interested to know what got you. Uh, what were the sort of triggers that got you interested in the blockchains? Actually, I'm not from the blockchain side, but we, we, were, we were planning to implement a decentralized production system in Uganda. And then we started realizing that the most logic way or most efficient way to implement it is to use blockchain. So it's, and that's why I got interested. And also I think then I, I dig deeper. So I think it's a pretty interesting system because before blockchain, it was like the most efficient way to produce something was to centralize it as much as possible so yes or i mean back in the days for example for fashion everybody produced her or his own fashion and then it got cheaper by having one person in town to produce fashion and then it got even cheaper by one country in one continent to produce fashion and then even it all went to like bangladesh to, and that's the most cheap and efficient way to produce fashion. But I think with blockchain, um, it's possible to reverse this trend. And I, I think it's not a, a trend that's good for humans, but only for, for um, cheap prices and cheap quality. And I think 
with blockchain, there's a possibility to um, have a decentralized, but at the same time, efficient system. And that's why I think it's such a powerful technology. For example, also the fact that, um, that it never has um, like, um, a, how do you, a blackout the system that you cannot stop it. That's such a powerful fact. And that's why I'm so amazed by the technology because even Facebook uh, has been down for one day last year. I mean, you all know that, but um, that will not happen with blockchain technology. So that it will always function. And I think that's the next level of efficiency. And at the same time, it can um, be better to people. So um, a more human or enable a more human uh, economy. So yes, that's why I got it. Thank you, yeah. Um, so um, what sort of challenges do you see to, uh, in terms of what you've learned so far? Uh, versus that ideal uh, that you've described? What are the sort of challenges that you see ahead? In which context? Uh, in terms of you've, you've described a world in the sense where it could be fairer, we can get like local production and that would benefit the uh, uh, local economy rather than um, a remote corporation and uh, uh, you know, its power. Um, so what are the challenges that from what you've learned so far about this technology versus this ideal that you've described, what do you see as the challenges ahead for you or well, to realize that? Yes, okay. I think um, there are so many ways to exploit the system and it's, it's something you cannot build top down because then you will make mistakes and people will be able to exploit it. So it really has to grow from, from the bottom up. So for example, at Wire Collective, we're not um, sitting down in a dark room and thinking about how we will make a production system that's decentralized, but we are building a kind of centralized production system. And then we try to uh, decentralize it one by one so that, because I think if you have, you cannot, um, um think about every possible way to exploit the system that's i think that's a huge problem and so it's a it's a process if you want to implement it you're muted yeah <laughs> <laughs> um so in a sense what you're doing is saying okay we don't know where we're going so we'll just do little trials we'll be um use our uh, by learn by doing basically is that what you're sort of saying yes so that i mean if you implement it decentralized from the bottom i mean somebody has to implement it and that's already a centralized aspect i think it's awesome how how especially here from europe is i always see myself um being confused because i have never experienced a decentralized system. And I think there are always so many surprising aspects if you really think it through. So, but yes, you have to do it one by one so yeah. that you get exploited. I don't know, how do you, uh, how do you feel about it? Oh, you don't want to get me started on that. <laughs> 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 uh, um, well, he won't stop. He won't. He just yeah. don't. <laughs> I won't be able to go to bed. <laughs> um, well, come on, Jack. Maybe you could fill in what you were thinking about in terms of, say, from the creative sector and from the music side of things. I mean, a lot of what Carolyn was saying sort of reflects your own view in many respects, doesn't it? Well, it's more or less giving rights back to the local communities because blockchains in themselves can transfer wealth, right? They you can we all can now create our own stores of value, um, and because this whole space is predicated on the vanguard of open source technology, with the idea of information being free and open to bootstrap innovation, that anyone can take these ideas and more or less start their own thing. Um, and 
you're right. Like we, we the, the whole centralization thing is more or less prone to failure and can be exploited easily in the sense that uh, people, uh, it's, it, it cascades. If something goes wrong, it, it reflects and basically can collapse everything else underneath it. If, if the hubris of humanity, as it has done previously before, uh, more or less creates a tumbling house of cards. Um, and the, the, the thing is here is now we can create our own markets in a sense um, and have markets everywhere, essentially, that basically can isolate failure should they and th that necessarily don't reflect across all other markets in a sense um and we can finance new and new ideas and we can get people to come into this in, into a, a small little bubble to start building ideas and start creating shit, uh whatever whatever the means of those bubble those communities want that thing to be made for Right. So, like, so like, like you, a band, if the band wants to, wants to, you know, uh, release an album and maybe do a decentralized label, uh, with more transparent rights, uh, in a sense, uh, you totally do that. Yeah. So to give you a little context, Jack, Jack has said he did a degree in music. He actually did a degree in commercial music. So he was looking at all the, uh, industry side of music. So he's been quite interested in the, um, uh, the you're you're playing your guitar oh, again, Jack. Was that? <laughs> so I know um, have it on mute because I just like need yeah. a fiddle or something. I'm I'm always yeah. Uh, um. So so Angela, I would like to hear from you in terms of similar sort of question. What brought you along into the space? And uh, you know what? You know, yeah. Just what brought you into it? What made you interested in it? I think the, the fascinating thing about a uh, catalyst in general is to see how many different people from different places are unhappy with the current systems that they have and how much um, the setup as it currently is, whether it's in Germany or it's in Uganda, isn't currently working for us. And so the community, I'm, I'm really, really enjoying the community. I found, I found the community quite accidentally. <laughs> Um, by clicking on links, uh, just following the links, and I landed. <laughs> uh, and then I stayed because I got to meet so many people's grandfathers and so many people's children and so many people's mothers wandering in the back. And I'm like, oh, I love this. <laughs> just to see ordinary people all over the world trying to make their situation better. And I think that's been really, really inspiring and and meeting all the characters. Um, I've had a really fun time. I've had a, an amazing time just having a blank screen and just watching in fascination as, as the world tries to make itself better. And so something about the hope of a decentralized situation, something about the immutable uh, data and something about the hope that it gives me um, is is quite inspiring. I think I I'm coming from a situation where my outlook on life was pretty bleak, and so the hope just underlying this whole thing is what has me coming back. And in, in the sense of uh, bleakness, in terms of where you see the world heading, sort of thing, with different aspects that are going. Yeah, on. and and feeling quite helpless as to what what to do about that. Feeling quite. But given that, um, given that, for example, the the internet when it first came out, and indeed the web when it first came out, um, had the same sort of aspirations as we're in with the blockchain space now yet it ended up being centralized. And indeed the outage of Facebook probably improved the welfare of the world for six hours. The fact that you know, we were all probably a little bit happier for Facebook not being up, I don't know. Um, Moods went up by 85%. <laughs> um, so what, what concerns would you have therefore with this technology space that we're in now? Um, that it doesn't work out to be that ideal. To bring a very random example into it, there's a, 
as far as I can remember the story, a scientist who went out, I think it was somewhere in the UK in the 1800s and asked a hundred people to guess the weight of a cow and guessed, ask out one expert to guess the weight of a cow. And the community came closer to the weight of the cow than the individual. So it's a very random example. But what I'm hoping is that if we do function as a collective, and you know, I'm hoping that our collective intelligence and our collective um, goodwill will improve n no matter what our collective uh, mal malice might you know, bring. So I'm coming at it from quite, quite a hopeful perspective that as long as we have these open meetings and as long as we're open to listening to whoever shows up, whether they seem to make sense or not, and as long as we, we, we get as many collective insights in, I'm hoping it sort of works itself out and we don't know what we're gonna create. We, we, we really don't, we're, we're, we're here to find out and we're here to the, make those mistakes. And as, as far as humanity has existed, we have never quite gotten it perfectly correct, but each generation has tried and tried again and tried again. And so we're just here to try again, I think. And, and that's the idea of this, this log of immutable facts. Does that help in your mind? Um, yeah. Well, we're going to see, aren't we? You know, what if the, the math suddenly fails us? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. How did you, I mean, I know you've done the Plutus Pioneer program as well. And I just was so curious as, so you've come from architecture. You've started programming. Had you had exposure to functional programming before? No, this is my first round with functional programming. But as Hell yeah. <laughs> As everyone has, <laughs> I've done the object oriented, you know, the usual. Um, so once you get your mind around the functional programming, it's really quite simple, um, but it, it's quite the hill to climb to get your mind around it. Uh, so those who are willing to start climbing that hill, those who get halfway, those who get to the top, so, <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's sad for me to know because I've been programming in functional languages since the mid nineties. Um, so um, it used to be quite a time where um, I uh, I would be considered too theoretical for a lot of jobs that I was interviewing for at the time, because functional programmers were seen as being this academic sort of class. Uh, but these days, it's, uh, yeah, these knees, oh, you do functional programming, oh, cool, <laughs> on that front. Um, um, uh, oh, I was going to ask Peter, but it looks like he's dropped off. Um, I was going to ask Peter a question, but Joe, um, aside from the fact that you've known me for, what, 10 years, what made you interested in all this blockchain space? <clears throat> okay, so the 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 um the work that we've been doing has been um and I use the expression community led. Um I have a passion, I think like Angela said before, um for people and for their potential. Um and There is a um, we had we had a meeting on on Friday with a young entrepreneur who's in our who's been in our ecosystem for a little while, Johan, and um, he did a a degree in mechanical engineering, and he's been working for a um, an engineering firm, and um, he came up to me at uh, an event. He came to an event because he saw it advertised in the newspaper came to the event loved it um and uh came up to me after the event because i'd been pointed out to him as one of the one of the people that had organized this event and he said um i don't want to work for somebody else all my life <laughs> i want to carve my own path um 
and uh, it seems like this is the place to do it. And uh, I've been told that you're, you're somebody that can help me. And um, that happens to me on a regular basis because of the, because of the work that I'm privileged to do. And um, that's what lights me up. Unfortunately, currently, with the, with the status quo system that we're saddled with, um, that kind of initiative and, um, you know, very personal desire gets squashed and, and um, you know, diverted into somebody else's dream, you know, rather than the individual like Johan following their own dream. Because, oh, there aren't enough resources or no, that's not going to make enough money for, for me to get my return on, on investment or um, it doesn't fit with the, um, you know, with the portfolio of things that this particular, you know, local town or city or, or wherever it is, is focusing all its resources on. So either get with our program or um, go somewhere else, <laughs> you know. And uh, we just waste so much human potential that way um, because of a very centralized system that that um, that stops people doing what they were what they came to this planet to do, <laughs> what they literally arrived to do. And um, so, I've been working for for a long time to to work out how we can how we can make the system. Um, here in New Zealand, um, fairer um, equality of opportunity is the is the purpose of the organisation that I founded, which is Venture Centre, um, and that means digging into the problem over the last eight eight odd years. The problem is at the governance layer, and it's at the resource allocation layer. And it's at the control layer. There's no shortage of great ideas. There's no shortage of support, um, frameworks, um, patterns to follow, um, supportive communities to dig in and help people. None of that is in short supply. What's in, in short supply is the quote unquote permission to be able to get on, to get on with whatever it is that you want to do. And that permission is um, only only called permission because there is there are people that are controlling the resources, you know, and you need to seek their permission to get hold of those resources. So the idea of, of blockchain being able to even out the flow of resources and become, um, you know, a way for people to really be able to um, explore you know whatever it is that lights them up like Jack with his music or um, Johan with you know now getting involved in the Cardano community um, that's 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 why I'm here is because of the community because of the people and because the the resource allocation is not held by a small group of people with an agenda okay I'd be interested Bob in, in terms of um... Yeah, you've been involved in large multinationals going through the FMCG sector. Um, and obviously as an executive that has to make decisions and stuff, and you're concerned about the organizational sort of aspects. What sort of interests you in the blockchain from that lens um, is the problems that you have discovered in trying to operate organizations. Uh, and yet you've heard here a lot about the discussions of trying to lift people up from the bottom. You know, what's, what's your thoughts on all of that? Well, um, I, I mean, I share Angela's view and all our views uh, in terms of being very optimistic about how blockchain will enable transformation. Uh, the transformation will happen on many levels. And from my personal point of view and from what I can see, a lot of others that it starts with with myself in terms of transforming myself in terms of learning new technologies um, engaging with new people understanding what's happening in the planet so it's your yourself is a starting point um, in terms of 
um, you know, uh, learning new skills, uh, exposing yourself to new opportunities, uh, new networks, new contacts. So that's, I guess, on an individual level. Um, from there, it uh, moves into the corporate space, which you mentioned. And what I find is that, um, yeah, the systems are quite uh, inefficient. Um, they are very protective, closed systems. So, yeah, I think, you know, Joe, you mentioned about permissions. You know, if you look at any large multinational, there's a lot of energy that goes to waste in terms of, um, you know, the internal discussions, the debates to make things happen. There's a lot of, whether it's bureaucracy or, you know, a lot of energy gets wasted in, in, in the discussion to make something happen and then there's protocol and so on. So, um, so I think, uh, you know, the individuals within the businesses may not uh, align with the, uh, let's say, you know, not just the commercial um, objectives, but also the way the way the businesses operate and so on. So I think um, it's good to have the decentralized platform where then people can move out of potentially those large uh, closed systems that, that are not that efficient at what they do. Um, you know, and uh, Carolyn, you mentioned, um, you know, the fashion space. Well, it's great if you want to do fast fashion and you want a million pieces at you know, at half a, like a half a percentage margin and everybody to buy the same shirt, that's maybe good in one way. But, you know, if you want an individual sort of fashion piece that's, you know, handcrafted and highly uh, sort of unique in its style and, 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 and um, sort of look and feel, then, you know, you, you go in the direction that we, that we discussed here today. So, so I think, um, yeah, and... And of course, within the organizations, um, you know, if they adopt it, they can do things a lot more um, efficiently in terms of, you know, whether it's the paperwork that's required, um, the distribution systems, the manufacturing process. So there's a lot of, um, there's a lot there that they can do, but I think they're slow to react. The larger the organizations, it takes them time to, you know, absorb these new technologies. And that also comes back to the educational space you know, Joe mentioned about, I think Anne as well, I'm not sure, but um, the, the educational system doesn't want to evolve as fast as the, the um, sort of the entrepreneurial space is evolving. So all of a sudden you've got, you know, um, a lot of the young people learning skills that may be partly relevant, but, you know, they don't teach you competitiveness. They don't teach you, they don't breed entrepreneurial spirit. They don't teach you how to be agile. They don't teach you a lot of the practical things that that can help you succeed, you know. So, um, so yeah, and then obviously above the corporation are the governments, and there's a global space. So, I think it's just an opportunity for me uh, at my sort of stage in my career as well is to uh, liberate myself from a large system which involves a lot of, um, uh, you know, uh, let's say there is collaboration, and you know, there's a lot of uh, definitely. Uh, benefit in working in a business like that but um, you know like the Toyota system which is a great system as well but in a sense it, it enables me personally to move and um, you know uh, chase some of my own passions uh, in terms of what I'd like to do so I guess that's it in a nutshell um, I'm not sure Robert if I've answered your question but uh, no, I, think I, it was great. I think I've given you a flavor yeah, I was, I was, I was kind of hoping to ask a question to you Bobbin as well yeah yeah I was also um, the mental model from the shift having come up from the sort of corporate background and especially in the area of finance uh, enterprises and stuff like that and private enterprise mm. it must have been quite a shock in a sense or maybe not because exactly what is it you kind of hope for that sort of uncertainty that big swirl of imagination um what, what was that like what, what was the switch that made it in your head that go like oh i'm gonna do this now Oh, this is totally what I want to do rather than like, you know, traditional sort of private enterprise, even executives mm. or anything like that have a sort of, oh, no, 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 they just dismiss this stuff. This is, you know, because there's a very linear way of how we do things and this is what I'm going to do and this is how we do it. Climb that corporate ladder and that's it. Like dismiss this whole area. What was the switch? Was yeah, well, I think uh, I think I've been self-driven with a, um, a strong self-driven creative with a strong dosage of entrepreneur entrepreneurial spirit in a corporation from, you know, when I was 24, over the last 25 years, let's say, right? So, um, you know, and I've, it comes back to your character and personality as well. I'm a little bit impatient, but I'm creative. I like to move fast. 
like to juggle different options. So you have to alter your style according to the, the corporation to an extent. Of course, you're not a slave to the corporation and you get, there's a lot, there are a lot of benefits there, you know, the global reach of these different systems and so on. So um, what led me here, and I touched on it, I think in the, the first uh, session I joined in was the fact that I saw some opportunities in Africa that I couldn't um, sort of, uh, you know, work on in the context of my organization, but I could uh, work on in the context of, you know, Project Catalyst and the, uh, the blockchain and so on. So, um, and, you know, I was actually looking at this project even before my, um, my closer look at the blockchain and Cardano. So when the, uh, you know, when I had a closer look at um, what Cardano uh, can provide in terms of all the tools, uh, you know, Tala Prism and, you know, the smart contract stuff, it just came together in terms of the project. So um, I found it really, um, let's say, um, enabling um, to be able to have this uh, quite a, a large portfolio of tools that are ready to go. It's just a case now to um, see how they can be implemented, um, you know, uh, along the lines of what the market really needs, you know. Um, so I think uh, you mentioned earlier on, yes, it's a challenge in, um, I think uh, Tivo mentioned it, it's a challenge in fine tuning what the problem is and what the solution, but also from my point of view, is uh, taking a helicopter view on what uh, Cardano can do in the context of what I would like to be done, you know, because um, there's so many different tools out there. I mean, you've got a Tala Scan and Tala Trace, um, you know, Tala Prism, you've got the, um, the Marlowe um, space. So there's a lot there now. I'm just working through some of the detail to see how I can connect the dots and obviously work with other people that can, um, you know, give give uh, the project a reality check and a cold shower if it's going in the wrong way and all that sort of stuff. So, yeah, it's, it's I think it's uh, pretty exciting stuff, yeah. And you're not afraid of that uncertainty? Uh, no, no, I'm not afraid no. of that. I, I mean, actually no. inspired by the... Um, the potential for um, change and transformation um, that can happen because, um, you know, you can move faster as well. Um, uh, you know, uh, within a business, there are so many dimensions that uh, you need to uh, consider um, which portfolio you've got, what financial metrics you need to um, achieve, you know, you've got an existing, you know, uh, budgets to work with. So there are constraints and it's great to uh, find solutions within those, within that framework. That's all good and it's quite normal. But um, when you've got, uh, you know, such a platform uh, as Cardano uh, and the blockchain, um, there's so many different uh, tools that you can take. And I like the fact of, you know, the individual can create a business as well and partner up with other people, have a decentralized network of like-minded uh, people in a particular space that can be a, a very transformational um, and, you know, add value to different people. So, you know, like in the fashion space, I really appreciate, you know, unique pieces as opposed to, you know, a um, thousand people in one location building a, a one dollar t-shirt that, you know, everybody's going to wear. I mean, well, it's, uh, it's almost, it's, sorry. Sorry, sorry, go on, Jack. No, okay. it was, it's almost like with a thousand t-shirts thing. It's like people go overseas and they go to what they feel what's most familiar to them rather than actually trying the unique cuisine of the given location or, you know, cuisine of the, of the country and yeah. culture. Yeah. But like, I oh, know yeah. McDonald's, I'll go to that one, you know, mass producer. Yeah, yeah. Familiar with that one. Yeah, and having attended some, um, you know, fashion shows in Accra, um, being, being involved through my company, I mean, the, the, the design, the color, the, um, the energy that each individual brings is really powerful, you know vis-a-vis -vis the large corporation that, you know, um, uh, you know, um, produces a thousand pieces per day, whatever the case may be. So, mm. um, Robert, did I give you a flavor of uh, what you asked for? Or they just yeah, uh, no, I'm, throw, it I'm out, throw it out there and hope, <laughs> throw it out I, there and hope for the best. <laughs> I, I'm very interested to know what brings people along to this whole, uh, both the blockchain space and also Cardano in particular. Because I've been in it for such a long time. Um, I was in the field of financial cryptography um, from the mid 90s, which is when David Chalm was doing his DigiCash sort of work. And then Ian Griggs and Systemics was working Ricardo. And there's all these other things that led up to Bitcoin 
coming about. So Bitcoin mm -hmm. certainly wasn't the first in the space. And um, I was particularly interested in the notions of privacy and identity um, because I was really concerned having developed some analytical systems for the Intel, uh, that ended up actually, it actually was first used in the fast moves uh, by Tesco Direct. We drove mm -hmm. quite a lot, lot of the um, uh, e-commerce stuff for Tesco Direct, which was the one of the more successful dot-com e-grocery sort of businesses mm -hmm. around yeah. and still goes today. Um, yeah. But then that actually started getting used in the intelligence community or this data, uh, the tools that we had used. And so I became quite concerned about the use of data uh, and how people could actually, um, well, what could be done in terms, and we, we experienced this today, you know, all the discussions today about algorithmic transparency and all those sort of things. Um, but uh, so I became quite interested in the notion of privacy. And in particular, I was quite inspired by the work of uh, Lawrence Lessig's uh, Coder's Law work. Uh, where he developed sort of creative commons. And in one of his book, uh, in the Codeless Law book, he had actually written that a lot of the stuff to do with the creative sector could be used to solve privacy related problems. Um, and so in researching that, I um, started to realize the importance of money, the notion of money. And which is really odd because I'd worked in the financial sector for quite a long time in the banking mm -hmm. sector, doing trading systems and stuff like that. But you never actually asked the question, what was money? What did it do? Mm -hmm. Yeah. How do you know what is it? How does it come come about? Um, and so um, I was doing a whole lot of exploration in that space. And going, I was literally like going off to community currency. Uh, conferences and things trying to meet people and trying to understand this um, and uh, because uh, the reason was in order to do private protect privacy you had to have a notion of a contract and in order to have a contract you needed to actually work uh, you needed a notion of commitment um, in other words some sort of skin in the game is a simple way of doing it and the typical approach that we use, this is the notion of capital in uh, one meaning of it, uh, that you can put some capital up at risk. And from that, it sort of just uh, ballooned. Anyway, um, I came across uh, Bitcoin not long after I was uh, doing a conference at a community, uh, did a keynote at a com uh, community conference in 2009 started playing around with it because I was on the list and did a bit of mining and that sort of stuff, but never thought it would go anywhere. <laughs> but I was very interested in uh, the approach that Satoshi had taken um, and uh, that that actually built upon a lot of the work that Nick Sarvos and Mike Miller had done um, that I was you know, acutely familiar with. So um, that's a sort of short... Uh, reason why I came to it. And because um, I have been quite involved in it, like I was very, uh, very much aware and paying a lot of attention in 2007 when SafariCon was rolling out in PESA uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, paying attention to that. And I still remember that one of the, uh, there was a research paper that I was absolutely fascinated that Nokia um, had commissioned around the time that M-Pesa had come through, which was looking at the effects that M-Pesa had on women in Kenya. Yeah, mm -hmm. and it was really, it was an anthropology sociology paper. And it was really fascinating how it had changed the dynamics of the relationship between um, the men and women in Kenya, you know, from the idea of urban remittance, the changes of the, the, the country wife versus the city wife, that sort of thing, and all those sort of dynamics. Um, and the fact that it was actually giving more power back to women um, and changing the economic situation whereby, you know, the money was coming back only once a month via the bus route and that sort of stuff. And so the uh, local suppliers of goods were jacking up the prices towards, you know, the payday period. And so, of course, the women were always running out towards the end of the month. 
And then with the introduction of M-Pesa, you started to get an evening out of that and it started to give control back to women. This was the, the paper at the time. And I found that incredibly fascinating that that dynamic was as occurring through a, a clear and trustworthy payment system that was accessible because it changed the social dynamics as a result of doing that. Um, and so uh, these sort of things, um, you know, to me, that's a, an example of uh, uh, economic information system at work. That's fundamentally what markets are as economic systems. There, there are information systems that enable us to move this uh, allocation of our resources effectively around. Um, and that sort of just made me revisit a whole lot of the stuff that um, I had worked on in the past. So I'd worked on uh, derivative systems and I used to think, well, they're just socially acceptable forms of gambling, you know, because the traders would literally uh, set up OTC contracts amongst themselves because they could around all sorts of things. You know, and basically do betting and things because they were just doing pairwise contracts um, and working on cross-border trade settlement things and payment systems and stuff like that. So it made me revisit a whole lot of these sort of things. Um, and, you know, since then, you know, I've been doing a whole lot of work in that area. So it's quite hard for me to understand mm. why people are interested in it and what their expectations of the technology is. Because I kind of, but I think, yeah, uh, I so, kind of just breathe it. Yeah, that's. <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. It's almost like second nature for you. Yeah. So, but I was, I was just sort of reflecting on some of the comments you made. Um, you know, what is it? What does the blockchain do? Do and and I thought it's it's about reach, really. It's about um, uh, an individual uh, enabling an individual to uh, to. Uh, to ensure that their creativity and you know some of the value that they can generate cannot doesn't have to just go from a, a village to a town to a city it can go global and so that's what i think is liberating is what what's liberating here is the fact that um, the blockchain enables each individual to um, to take their energy their creativity and their capacity to generate Whatever, they, whatever it is they want to generate, whether it's value or contribution or whatever the case may be, it can now go global and it doesn't have to rely on any, um, you know, uh, sort of um, entity, other entities, it, it can work on the platform. So I guess that's, that's my thinking at its most fundamental. Uh, yeah, but I'd, I'd also actually argue here that it's not, it can also be, it's this um, kind of oxymoron in the sense it can be hyper-local and hyper-global at the same time. Yeah, but the individual decides, right? So yeah. that's the key. So they can say, well, I want to work in Melbourne and that's I'm great with that because it's a good city. Or um, guess what? I want to um, you know, do ABC in markets one, two, three. And uh, without the blockchain uh, being an enabler to that, I mean, you can do it, but it's just uh, you've got to work you know, five, ten times harder to make it happen. So I think, I think it's liberating um, human capacity to reach other markets, other people, other, you know, systems um, with what it, what it is that they want to offer and what it is they want to um, generate, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Tivo, you had your hand up before. Do you still? Uh, I'm, I'm, I was going to ask you that question, the, the question or two as well, what brought you into the space here? Um, oh. But you had your hand up. Uh, I'm just report, um, responding back to Boban. Uh, like the first thing you said that uh, uh, that it's all about reach or like it has like the highest impact, but I think it's just an effect. Uh, what happens when people have what you and Robert described the power to create value, generate value, and, and the fact you can prove the value exists and the people you locally know they. They, they strengthen their ties in the network, but and at everybody else in the blockchain on the open blockchain can see it, that okay, there is something value is created there. And there are these kind of visions or processes or transactions taken to, to do this. So now everybody has the ability to just also say, I, I like what they do. I'm not sure what they, where they're going, but it seems to great value. And, and then 
creates like this network effect um, and to reach what happens from that. Mm. But yeah, if you yeah, ask you're, me, you're, Yeah, I'm you're right, going. Tiva. I think the, the synergy of that process is also exponentially powerful in terms of individual, gr small group, large group, and it can the scalability is quite um, uh, uh, sort of powerful. So I guess you're, you're right from that. Uh, I'd just like to welcome Simon and Rose. Um, if you want to introduce yourselves, please um, do so. Uh, uh, your new faces, so uh, yeah, welcome to the room. Uh, yeah. Thank you. We... Thank you. Rose, like who wants to? Okay, maybe I'll start. So, yeah, hi, hi uh, thanks. Hi. Ah. <laughs> and Japanese, just Japanese break room finished, so I joined. This room. Oh, lovely to see you, right? Yeah. So, uh, yeah. It's nice for you. You're welcome in here and it's nice to have you on board. Uh, so, yeah. Mm. Yeah, and for me, I'm coming from uh, the Indonesian uh, breakout room and Jan said, I have to talk to you, Robert. So he said, literally, I have to say this to you. <laughs> so <laughs> he said, I should come here and tell you this. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, go ahead. What is it? <laughs> Uh, so, um, but I, I don't want to, like, I don't know because I'm just joining your group now, whether, you know, I don't want to interrupt any no, uh, no, no, theme no, no. or, no? It's Actually, just, okay. uh, Simon, um, maybe because in 10 minutes I have to go, perhaps, uh, we'll, yes. if that's okay, Robert. Yeah, 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 go. Uh, so you asked uh, also for everybody else, like, how, how did you get into this space? And... From the beginning, I, I have been like somebody mentioned here that has the students uh, or his son is playing uh, more than being interested in going to school. And I have had the same experience. I just played games uh, and uh, didn't really go to school. Mm, at some point, I found myself creating a game that that was more interesting experience uh, and learned scripting, learned to set up server website all of that, that so people could connect in that multiverse in a, in a sense like a multiplayer online game i was doing and and my my goal there was to create a story something interesting and very technically difficult so that you have to have a skill in order to be good at it and and from this like learning about these kinds of like the technical stuff and difficulties going to stack or flowing constantly bombarding people with questions. How you do did that? How did you do that? Can you teach me? And, and finding myself finally into uh, the, the blockchain community. I, I started from, I, I liked it also machine learning. So I was thinking, okay, I need to, so I'm so, so bad at drawing, maybe I can teach a computer to draw for me. And so <laughs> I can use that data. Uh, and, and, uh, and from that, I was like introduced to the blockchain that if you connect AI and uh, blockchain tech, because blockchain gives you a very good and structured data where you don't have to so put so much effort into cleaning and you can trust the network that it's true. And from there, I started learning more about Ethereum because Cardano was not out yet. I was like, oh, damn, I should start making uh, go to work, make some money and put that with these tokens because I know they will go up in value. And by the time I, I got my first paycheck, uh, I went to the ABB factory as a process engineer and also got there in, in such a weird way. But yeah, so long story short, I started finding out that, okay, these tokens increase in value a lot. And then I saw Cardano, which is like, you have all of it in the paper. You just have to only do it. And, and that's, uh, then, then I fall in love pretty much in those videos and look for these things. And now got invited to the Project Catalyst Fund one when the uh, when Dorgash Bash showed it in the last summit. And I was like, oh, cool, let's do it. And, and now every 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 day is just Project Catalyst since Fund one. Like just wake up for it, find people to coordinate, build stuff. You got a great idea. Me too. Let's do it. Let, let's draw it out and let's connect with the entire rest of the people that we have here and see where we could add 
the value of, of what we create in an open source way. So that was another thing I learned from making a game. I was thinking I do it very good at first before I show it, but after I showed it, the, the three, two years of engine, I thought it, found it very too hard to onboard people. So now every, I do everything open. So <laughs> as soon as you need yeah. something, I just tell you what, what is the current situation. Yeah, there is a, there is a tendency to, and as software engineers and, and definitely is to try and just work on something and wait till it's perfect before you reveal it to anyone. And whereas the opposite should really be true, uh, where we can try and experiment and, and we actually learn collectively as a result. And we can learn a lot faster, move a lot faster. And indeed, that's the whole idea of things like uh, the Lean Startup and the customer development sort of ideas was um, no, uh, no business plan suffice first contact with the customer type of situation. And so you're better off to try and uh, uh, touch base with them as soon as possible to learn. You're going to say jump. I prefer the um, I prefer the uh, the Mike Tyson version. Everybody's got a plan until they get punched in the face. Yeah. <laughs> I think mean, that's more appropriate. Yeah, because that's what well, it feels like to some young entrepreneurs, right? Like, oh my god, yeah. they hate what I've just done. Oh no, <laughs> don't stop. Keep going. <laughs> Keep going, indeed. No, I'm, I'm that sort well, of it's, it's a power of power of uh, co co creating and collaborating. Yeah, and getting getting together early in the process, so there's no surprises along the way, right? Hmm. I, I was Angela. I'd be intrigued to notice that you, because you started off in architecture, uh, and then gone, went across into software development. The differences in the disciplines and stuff, um, and the approach because. They're both creative, very creative industries, um, but one is constrained heavily by regulation. Yeah, how much time do you have? <laughs> all, the all the time in the world. <laughs> Give me chalk. <laughs> yeah, I'll get back to you on that one later. That's a whole discussion. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because yeah, one of the uh, interesting areas here, uh, like that will touch on all of the sort of stuff that Bob and Carolyn uh, are interested in, is actually the, the question of compliance and regulation, right? And so in this case here, how can it also apply to say like uh, building, uh, building management, building construction, is actually like, like the construction industry itself in terms of the way it's structured and all the compliance and all of the paperwork that goes along with it. Right, is open to being basically completely transformed by uh, this technology and principle. So it would be interesting to see. But before we head off or down on that, I just thought I'd better give Simon and Rose an opportunity to say, you know, as I said, uh, uh, fill us in a little bit as to, to what interests you guys. What I've been asking everyone here is what got you into the space? Why are you interested in blockchains? What was the thing that got you uh, hooked? Simon or Rose, one or the other? Rose, would you like to answer that? No? No, okay. Simon, or has he gone away? Okay, we'll wait. we'll wait for Simon to come back on that one and I'll ask him again when he pops back. Um, so, yeah, uh, one of the things is about compliance. Um, so one of the big areas here is some of the work that I've been doing um, over the last few years now and then uh, is something called Rules as Code, and Joe's uh, being involved as well. Um, and th this idea was to actually um, uh, codify all of the uh, body of regulation, right, in such a way that uh, it could be more easily used um, by and analyzed indeed, or implemented or integrated into existing systems. So we've done some of the work around that over the last few years. We got um, even got mentioned Jack, uh, a photograph of Jack's was featured in one of the OECD uh, GovTech reports from 2019, which I was quite, you know, thought that, that's cool. Um, 
so the idea here is that you can basically, um, I'll give you a good example. The our tax um, agency here, the Inland Revenue, um, implements all these rules around um, P, uh, payment tax, what we refer to as PYA, uh, P-A-Y-E, pay as you earn. And in all that these rules get embedded into uh, payroll technical systems. And um, the way they implement those rules is all the specifications for them, rule changes and the requirements around holiday pay and, um, and income tax and all that sort of stuff gets pushed out to the suppliers of these payroll systems and accounting systems as Word documents. And then they have to basically, each of them has to reinterpret all of that, okay? both the data structures and the requirements and everything else, and re-implement it in their systems. And as a result, the inland revenue spends a lot of money basically helping these um, software development companies that are right in the payroll systems uh, to actually do that integration, to make sure it's all correct, to make sure the rules are uh, right. And so one of the ideas here is that uh, essentially, instead of doing a build pack, which includes all these Microsoft Word documents, they produce open source code that implements the regulation. And that open source code can then be incorporated into whatever payroll system that is required. Uh, but it can then actually be reused into other contexts so it could be analyzed and interpreted uh, to make sure it's fair and consistent, those sort of things. And this is largely to do with prescriptive code. Um, the French government does this quite a lot already. And in fact, some of the ideas that we've worked with has come out of the French, French government. But it's the same sort of idea like with Marlowe, you mentioned, Bobbin, um, uh, where you can actually have uh, domain specific languages. And this is one of the Marlowe's what's referred to as a domain specific language that can actually implement a lot of these sort of pre prescriptive rules very efficiently. And so things such as building compliance. Um, and you've got to go, Angela. It's lovely to see you. <laughs> and thanks. And we'll see you again uh, next week uh, in a couple of weeks' time. Yeah, thanks a lot, Angela. Um, so this stuff can be implemented more efficiently um, into, like, say, food compliance or um, any of these sort of environmental concerns and stuff. So there's great lot of opportunity around that sort of space as well which uh, you know, I think would be pretty interesting. But Simon, since you're back here, I was just wondering if you um, wanted to intro yourself. You're in from uh, Indonesia and then uh, ask me whatever question you wanted to ask and uh, we'll go from there. Yes, thank you. Yes, thank you, thank you so much. So um, see, I was just talking to Jan and, um, and uh, when I was sharing about my project, and then he was sharing about your, you know, connecting people in East Asia and about that startup week. And uh, I think it's related to, to that, uh, why, why Jan wanted me to talk to you. So I'll give you like a very brief overview of the project. It's called Favors. And um, I'll post the link here. And um, it is about connecting people that want to learn something with people that have those necessary skills, you know, to meet the learning needs required. And one of the main use cases is, uh, it's very personal use case, you know, I've been um, facilitating um, workshops and inviting teachers from different countries and inviting uh, also like, you know, my meditation guru, uh, you know, from a different country to my hometown. So one of the main use cases is someone wanting to invite a teacher from somewhere else to a physical location you know to the to your hometown let's say and um then you know voting on that you know so there's a voting mechanism on you know so i i would invite for example my teacher from nepal to bali and then uh would put this up on favors and then uh invite my, my sangha here, my meditation friends. And then once enough, um, there's enough demand for that event, you know, then we could, another phase, would, another aspect would be gathering the resources, the financial and non-financial resources. So we would find out, okay, we need the flight to be paid and the workshop room, someone needs to cook and so on. So we would 
you know, gather all, you know, the, the requirements and also, you know, uh, find out who would want to contribute to the success of the event happening. So that is the, that's the main use case, you know, and other applications could be, you know, uh, I, you know, I would be maybe let's say I want to learn Indonesian, so I put this up there, and then someone else could say, you know, I, you know, we can meet in person, or there's a learning group you can join, or we can meet online. I can teach you this, and it can be, you know, with monetary or crypto exchange or not. You know, that's um, independent of that. Um, yeah, so that's that's it. That's the that's the project. Yeah. Oh, you're muted. Uh, <laughs> um, so effectively, you're kind of doing a uh, crowdfunding kind of marketplace for yes, for yes, events. yes, yeah. crowdfunding for events, co crowdfunding for co-created events. Okay, and what um, what what challenges do you see at the moment? And, and so this is what you what you're proposing here is basically is. Um, a coordination function to coordinate the funding for that event. So someone's wants to host event, bring someone across, uh, there's costs associated with it. And so you're effectively wanting uh, the, a community to be able to fund that event to happen. Yep. Yes, exactly. So there would, of course, be one initiator or host, right? The person with the most passion about this event, be it in person or online. And then there would be like others, you know, others also wanting that to happen and if there's enough um yeah demand interest passion for something to happen then it would happen so you know and i just want to provide the platform for that so that the community can create <laughs> whatever they want to create and you know and people can more effectively um, get their learning needs uh, met and more effectively you know share what what they are passionate about sharing that's mm. that's it yeah. Yeah. So the the event that um, Jan was referring to was um, so we've been funded inside of the Eastern Town Hall to run um, some a proposal was called Connecting East Asian Entrepreneurs, and the idea here is that the it was in the um, Entrepreneur DLT Entrepreneur Challenge, and the aim here is that there's a whole lot of people that are. Um, entrepreneurs, or would be, wouldn't call themselves entrepreneurs necessarily, but they identify a, a problem or they have a solution and they uh, want to figure out how to go about doing that. And so Joe, for example, here runs Venture Centre, which helps uh, quite a lot of um, people doing that. And there's an organisation in Indonesia called Kampo that does a very similar sort of thing. Uh, so what we've been funded for is to take that idea or that need, and then tailor it to the requirements of a blockchain. Saying, so if you're trying to do a blockchain sort of business, um, these are the things such as Bob and such as yourself. These are the sort of things you, you would consider, for example. So I see in your white paper there, you've got, you're using the business model canvas. So Joe's actually being funded to do a, um, a to do basically a canvas for that brings in the features of trying to design for a market-based, uh, for blockchain systems, basically cards, canvases, and calculators. Uh, so taking a, ver a variation of the business model canvas and expanding it with different properties to suit for considering within a blockchain space. And then basically teach people to do that with the aim of helping people to put proposals together into a particular catalyst fund. So we are aiming for fund eight as the first one, and we're doing it in Indonesia. Um, so that's sort of what that Jan was talking about in terms of the uh, what Joe's doing, what uh, and what we, Jan and I are doing uh, in terms of the two sort of proposals. What uh, you've been thinking about this, obviously, you've got the lean canvas um, as a sort of starting point. Um, so you've obviously got uh, familiar with that, uh, got introduced to that somewhere. And what, what sort of uh, things are you wanting to find out or understand better or uh, within what you're proposing? Yep. Simon? What, what, yes. What, yeah. What, what so, would you be interested yes. in? So, um, 
so Jan suggested maybe I, I wait maybe with the proposal for Fund7 or so and maybe join your project, uh, your uh, Connecting East Asian Entrepreneurs. Mm. And, uh, you know, because they said uh, there would be the startup week in January. And um, because he said like this, like the, the project is like, um, you know, matching some of like his ideas and his vision and maybe also something you've been talking about with him of like co-creating events, if I understand this correctly. And um, um, yeah, or... so what he would be, um, from what I can just see in terms of going through really quickly in terms of the, uh, your white paper that you put together, um, you've actually got sufficient to put a proposal up onto Fund 7 if you haven't, uh, I take it that's what you're sort of aiming for to see about getting developed. Yeah, I think actually you've got enough knowledge uh, that the event that Joan and I are planning to do isn't uh, necessarily suitable other than to uh, build connections and help you along and build a team out. But in many respects, you could probably do that already with um, Fund 7. And I would try that out. I would, I would do that if that's mm -hmm. what you're interested in. Um, the other thing that uh, Jan is talking about is um, a funding mechanisms. Okay. Um, so what I've been funded for in uh, Fund Six was actually something called a, what's referred to as retroactive project funding. Uh, and so I like markets. I like market systems, and this. So things such as uh, crowdfunding is a type of uh, market mechanism known as an assurance contract. Uh, and that basically means that the, the, if you think of Kickstarter and what you're doing here um, for the benefit of the others in the room, is that um, essentially there's a coordination function that's required in order to fund a project such as um, what you're describing, Simon, which is we need to basically um, get crowd, a crowdsource or the funding, but no one wants to fund, put money into something if they don't know the project's going to go ahead, right? So there's this notion of a coordinating mechanism known as an insurance contract within um, economic space, which basically says there's a condition upon funding. So if enough people come together and fund a project, then the project's going to go ahead. Yeah. So if you've met a threshold, the project goes ahead. Um, so if you take that as a starting point, the mechanisms that we've been funded for um, uh, is actually referred to as a risk-adjusted bonding curve. Now, it's a pretty exotic, fancy sort of financial instrument, but it takes this idea a little bit further uh, in the sense that um, now um, you can actually, you may have a threshold level uh, that something get, gets funded at, but something instead of Catalyst giving you a grant, Catalyst now says, I'm going to buy or sponsor the successful result. Okay, so if you are able to achieve your result that you set out to do and you, you know, whatever your success metrics were, uh, and that's another question, you know, uh, in terms of what are your success uh, metrics and how do you define it? Um, what you can actually do is enable um, not just people paying you, which is what you kind of suggesting here, but you can actually go further with speculators say, well, actually, I think this is a really good project. I think people are going to like it. So I'm going to invest in it. I'm going to invest in bringing Vitalik Buddha into your, uh, uh, in Jakarta off, you know, for a talk or Charles Hoskins, whatever, because I think this is a really good idea and I think the community will like it. But because uh, this is a really good example of the power of um, this underlining technology and what it can do. So I'm, I'm kind of uh, uh, taking advantage of uh, the fact that you're talking about market mechanisms here, Simon, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, to expand a little bit and explain, and partly to answer some of Anne's questions earlier, which is, um, you know, what is this technology good for? What can it be really useful for? And we were talking earlier about um, allocation functions and asking for permission and stuff within organizations. Um, but there's, there's a concept um, from economics. It was a paper in 1936 by a young economist at the time called Ronald Coase, which was basically asking the question is, 
if the market is supposed to be really, really efficient, you know, why do we have firms? Why do we have companies? Right. Um, and his answer was, well, actually, there's something called transaction costs. There's costs to negotiating, to searching, to negotiating and monitoring a contract, a market contract. There's real costs. But if we could lower those costs, right, lower those costs for people to trust and monitor and negotiate and find each other, et cetera, then the nature of the firm changes. It becomes more like a network, networked organization. See you later, Bob, and it's really good to see you again. And uh, yeah. Thank um, you very much. Good touch. Have a good night, everybody. Yeah. Bye-bye. See you later, Bob. Um, so if um, you can lower those costs, then you can um, essentially uh, coordinate more effectively and the firm becomes more like a network. So it flattens out. Okay. And an assurance contract like what you're proposing is um, a good example of that. Crowdfunding and the Kickstarters or any of those around is a good example. What the risk-adjusted bonding curve does is goes a little bit further and incorporates incentives to ensure uh, um, that there's monitoring and auditing of projects as well, which is and therefore gives an opportunity for investors to invest in your project and make money on it. So some, if so, but. Doing so because they're actually providing more information into the market space that this is actually a really worthwhile project, and I think it's actually uh, you know in terms of its proposal. So I'm going to invest in it because I think it's going to do really really well. And so it's a it's building upon what what you've got here. It doesn't fundamentally change your market position um, and the market you're going after. It's just a a way of say uh, increasing the successful, um, likely the, the opportunities for broader investment, uh, more events gives you wider distribution because there's a kind of speculative element added into the uh, financing of projects. So, uh, yeah, that's um, that's just a little bit um, sort of some of the things. Um, so from what I what I can see that you've done here, Simon, I'm 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 interested in your yeah. Go, Jay. I'm really interested in in your proposal. Um, can't see the white paper, but um, obviously Robert's got it. Um, we're always interested in having um celebrities <laughs> come to our events or or particular experts, right? Um. In a, in a particular you know field or area particularly if we run a um a themed event that has something specific like around food for instance or we did one on social enterprise or um we did a, a hackathon and had a um a rules as code event and had a, you know, a number of public servants come to that event um so yeah i'm just i'm just saying happy to collaborate with you on your on your proposal and would certainly tell toko um rob which means to support what rob said which is put a proposal up go through the process don't wait <laughs> get get in there and, and start doing it and and yeah absolutely you know get yourself onto um project catalyst as a as a proposer and get involved in the the community it's the best way just pile in there <laughs> so um find me i'm i'm yojo on project catalyst Y O J O. ah okay right at yojo yeah Y O J O. Y O J O. okay yeah. yeah um so i think you've got enough material just skipping through it without i haven't read it in detail i think you've got enough material there to put up a pretty good proposal already up into fun yeah. and, and go for it yeah um and uh, pro prove it out if you haven't already. Um, I'm assuming you haven't put a proposal yeah. up because I do vaguely remember seeing no. some. No, 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 I haven't. Yeah. <laughs> so I it lay low in the, because, you know, I, I work here in Indonesia, so it's like, you know, I have like very limited uh, time resources, but it's like, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so uh, I, I, I would definitely put, put, put one up.
um, mm. go for it. Okay. Uh, You've got, uh, in terms of the way you've structured everything and you're thinking about stuff, you're, I mean, a lot of the proposals that go up onto Catalyst, you um, uh, aren't, don't have to be that detailed, right? Because it's basically, you're trying to look for sort of discovering what's possible. And um, in this case here, you, um, uh, you've, well, you're, you're doing a, what are you reading, Rob? I'm oh, reading the white paper. So, so, yeah. So it's like I'm not I'm not stuck on any of these things. Yeah, that was like um, on any of these ideas. For example, ICO or whatever. Right. So it's a that's brain why dump. I took some. Uh, not it's not a brain dump, but um, um, so I'm not stuck on like tactics or strategy. So um, so I put everything there and also like the videos you know ex try to explain the different use cases you know not all of them there's one more mm -hmm. like about group buying which it could be used for but my, really my heart is in events so um but i'm not stuck on the ideas which i think i've mentioned about like you know maybe doing an ICO or so that was one idea of getting funding but of course now i've met um you know catalyst and so on so you know um um yeah yeah well catalyst is not going to um fund a complete project like this right yes yes but i it, understand it's like yeah. your know, mini yeah mini, mini but it will support. give you um there's two aspects to it that it will one it will give you uh legitimacy within the cardano space for starters the cardano community right because you've been funded so therefore you'll get um distribution people will pay more attention to what you're doing um, I think overall, you know, what you're doing, what uh, there's room for um, probably improving things by um, looking at, rather than doing a straight out token, incorporating uh, token mechanics right into, and the fact that you're doing an assurance contract, um, you know, there's an advantage to doing something where the the actual value of the token is intrinsically tied to the activity on the network, on your protocol, what you're doing. So there could be advantages in doing that. The downside of approaching that is you would need someone like me to help you out um, you know, in terms of like doing the design for that, doing the implementation, those sort of things. Uh, and you wouldn't necessarily, I, I think for this, what you're putting together, you're actually wanting to prove more that there's a market for the sort of service and the front end and the app, D app that you're actually proposing, then necessarily whether you could refine the underlining uh, uh, market mechanism or improve upon. Mm, the, yes, uh, because this. Yes, because yes. Thank you, thank you. Yes, because I don't yet know what the best mechanisms are. You know, I you know I have some ideas of some principles, and I know there's different aspects like the voting and the funding for example you know and the getting feedback and the improving of an idea for an event and these things but i don't you know i have had like when discussing with people or developers who did the prototype i um which was all self-funded <laughs> um it's um you know there there came up different ideas you know of different stages of you know how this kind of crowdsourcing crowdfunding funding platform you know could could uh, function yeah you know maybe first there could be like a, a voting phase then there could be like a funding or funding for you know financial crypto slash non-financial resources and so on you know so and um yeah so these things actually i'm not clear about very specifically what is the best way how to do these things and that because it doesn't exist yet right so and i don't know of it any does other, like, it does it does getting really where get involved in get involved in catalyst and oh okay <laughs> it's like and, and i'm finding this this a lot with with the work that i do over here i actually well. don't know much um, yet about this this is my second call i think i'm sorry yes dig yeah. in so yeah. dig in to project catalyst to the to the funding the funding process because everything that you're describing because i'm not reading anything this i understood from the first yes mm. is is in there so proposing voting setting up challenges mm. voting on which challenges um mm. putting up proposals to the challenges voting on the proposals 
Yes, um, exactly. I'm getting good. Assessing, yes. assessing the proposals, having assessors yes. assess the assessors. Mm. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like yes. all the layers yeah. of, of process. One of the yes. things okay, that you're going to love it, mate. Yeah. One of the things mm. that just <laughs> just reading it and stuff because your interest is in um, events. There's actually uh, this is related to the problem, some problems that Joe's got at Venture Centre and Kumpel have got at Venture Centre uh, in Indonesia as well. Is both these organisations run events, got a lot of different events, and so you're talking about bringing someone across, but actually it's valid to their situation as well, where you know they might actually, um, and indeed. Joe and I run something called Legal Hackers here in New Zealand. We are co-organizers of Legal Hackers. And um, these are community-based groups, um, which are quite hard to actually find sponsors for. You know, we need to pay for venues of, of forms or the cost of running them. Uh, but yeah, they're actually quite hard to get funded. So this would fit really nicely in that sort of uh, area where there's different sort of needs for different um, organizations. Um, so, and in addition to that, um, as I looked at some of the problems around uh, what Kampo are trying to do and what Joe's um, issues around what are called membership systems, where you're essentially trying to um, run lots of different events where a person might be, you know, need to, to reach a certain level of skills uh, because, for example, have they been exposed to the, the Lean Canvas before, for example? Uh, and if they haven't, you want to introduce them to the Lean Canvas. So that might be a workshop, that might be a meeting or something else. Um, and in many respects, you might, this, this is generally how do you bring on board skills? Um, and so it's not just one event or anything else like that. It's actually could be a series of events because it's actually a kind of, can we fund the learning journey? Um, and so this sort of thing could be quite easily extended to incorporate that sort of idea of helping to fund learning programs. And Anne would be quite familiar with that sort of problem as well. Um, you know, it's not a single event. Mm. It's, it's, it's about mm. basically trying to reach some sort of behavioral change in the persons that you're actually trying to teach to give them new skills so that they can see the world in a different way. Uh, and you can fund those sort of ideas, you know, uh, that sort of program where there's some very sort of discrete events in between and uh, you know, in terms of milestones reached and stuff of different people through the program. Uh, again, a lot of it is about running events. In this case here, you're taking a longitudinal view of the, the events because there might be several interrelated whereas uh, a person's going through a particular journey through different stages as opposed to just a, a discrete event. Both are required, um, but you know, there's a from one-off events to uh, uh, event happening over the whole time. So, for example, the, the Connecting East Asian uh, Entrepreneurs funding that we've got is going to happen over a one-month period where we have very discrete events that are structured because it's a virtual event. We want to try and replicate the in-person experience. So we have to make sure that people turn up at certain points along that journey to uh, network, just to meet each other really, to try and simulate it. Uh, and also to uh, make sure that, you know, there's Zoom, uh, that they've got skills in using Zoom, using the chat, that sort of thing. Um, and just understanding what, you know, a session about what is a blockchain? So I might, you know, come in and do that. <laughs> and so, and then the final uh, part of the event is, is a two-week period or, uh, where they're formed into a team, okay? And then they've got to try and put a proposal together. Um, and so we don't want people that have not attended all the other sort of pre-events to show up at last minute and expect to come into a team, right? So we need to know that they've gone through several other events, that they are familiar with things like the Lean Canvas, they are familiar with an overview of what a blockchain represents. So they can actually start iterating 
uh, straight away when and in a team they've decided to form a team and go through that's a kind of a journey sort of situation and it'll be great to see things like that funded in what you're proposing here Simon I think there's a lot of potential for it thank you thank you so I wouldn't wait for uh, oh, what we're doing oh, in Indonesia. I would go straight in. Yes. <laughs> Life just changed, Simon. Huh? <laughs> Life just changed for you. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but th that's exactly just, the sort of I've, thing that uh, Joe and Anne and, and the guys at Kampo and stuff would be all sort of looking for. How can we do that sort of stuff? Hmm. Hey, I've got to, I've got to go, um, Rob. Everybody, yeah. it's been really nice. Yes, and um, um, I, to I meet do you. too. Yeah, I do too. So, um, uh, indeed, thank you very much for coming along, uh, uh, Simon and Anne. Thank you for being here, and Tivo, if you're still around, I don't know. Thank you for having you. us. <laughs> yeah, you're more than welcome. And I hope you got something out of it, Anne. Uh, and that you learned something. Very, else. very, I'm still here. You know, it's like, wow, very <laughs> inspiring. Cool. Very inspiring. Cool. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much for that. Simon, just, um, you know, uh, you've got, uh, have, Joe, have you sent, you've, uh, she's yeah. on campus. Yeah. 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 So um, go for it. Catch up with you all during the week. Yeah. And have um, I'll have a little I'll read. be sending you an email, Joe. Hmm. Perfect. Awesome. I look forward to it. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Well, thank you all. It's been Have lovely. Good night. Good night. Thank you so Thanks, much, everyone. Thank you Cheers. so much. Thank you for hosting. Hit